Ken is the director of media at UBI Works. He works closely with Floyd Marinescu, who will be part of the entertainment after the break. <laughs> um, and he oversees media and content for UBI Works. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Ken over the years, and UBI is a terrific guy, and he's going to give us some insight that's uh, very focused on Canada. So you have somewhere between five minutes and one hour. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, hello. All right, good evening. My name is Ken Yang, and it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Dr. Forche for such a magnificent talk. I'm going to take us through a lightning round on recent developments on basic income right here in Canada. Hopefully by the end, you have the who, what, when, where, why of this policy. So basic income in Canada is quite an active movement from coast to coast. These are just some of the organizations that are leading the charge today. I'm going to talk about three things. What Canadians think about basic income, what the latest research tells us, and what actual programs and legislation exist in real life. So what do Canadians say when they're asked about this? This 2019 Gallup poll showed that three quarters support a basic income to help those who lose their jobs due to automation. This Angus Reid poll showed that about six in 10 Canadians support a basic income between 10 to 30K a year. This ledger survey showed that basic income is actually a top three issue for Canadians in the last federal election. And then this narrative poll of research showed about six in 10 support a means-tested guaranteed basic income, while about four in 10 support a universal basic income where everyone gets a payment. Now this idea really entered the mainstream spotlight in 2020. Here's Floyd Manescu of UBI Works, who you'll hear from in a bit, giving a speech on stage with a robot about automation and basic income at the Ontario Liberal Party Leadership Convention. This was March 2020. A few days later, a pandemic was declared and millions lost their source of income. And then UBI Works immediately launched a national petition campaign for an emergency basic income. And then 60 CEOs from Western Canada, representing a majority of private sector investment there, issued a statement saying, we need universal and immediate income support for all. About a week later, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, CERB, was announced. 50 senators co-signed a letter calling for CERB to be turned into a minimum basic income. 40 reference and bishops issued a letter calling for basic income. 167 Canadian health professionals did the same thing. A number of chambers of commerce came forward in support of a national pilot. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce, Hamilton, Thunder Bay, and then later the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce. Then during the 2021 federal election, candidates in three parties across nearly half of all ridings signed a pledge that if elected, they would actively support the establishment of a basic income. 15 of them were elected out of a total of more than 40 known champions in parliament. Now, what do we know about the impacts of basic income in Canada? We heard from Dr. Forge earlier who helped uncover the landmark evidence from the Manitoba Mincome experiment where we learned that hospitalization dropped 8.5%. More students stayed in high school and graduated, and the vast majority of people continued working, with the exception of new moms and teenage schoolboys. There was a pilot in Ontario in 2017, one of the most anticipated programs of our generation. There were three sites, Hamilton, Lindsay, and Thunder Bay. 4,000 recipients would get a basic income of up to $17,000 a year, 24,000 for couples, and 70% of these people were already working. Now, you might already know what happens next. Doug Ford won a majority in 2018, canceled the pilot, despite insisting he wouldn't do it, leaving thousands devastated and cutting the world off from valuable research. So in the aftermath of this, a group of over 100 Canadian CEOs and business leaders signed a letter urging the Ontario government to reinstate the pilot. You can see Chris there on the right, as well as Floyd. Basic income marches and rallies were held, starting in Toronto and then eventually across the country. You can see Sheila Regeer there of the Basic Income Canada Network and Floyd and Chris again, alongside the late Senator Hugh Siegel. Now, the social services minister at the time said, this is really a disincentive to get people back on track. Let's see if she's right. A pilot, a survey of pilot participants showed that over a third of those who were working actually found higher paying work. Most of them were more, more motivated to find higher paying work. A quarter of them started education and training. Half of them volunteered more. They smoked less. They drank less. 
and they ate way healthier food. This couple from Lindsay used their basic income to grow their healthy food business, which is now thriving. And they even noticed that customers were spending more money when the basic income program rolled out. Interestingly enough, two years later, Andrew Shear's conservatives would actually propose reforming CERB to be more like the pilot, where workers keep part of the benefit when they get back to work in order to reduce the disincentive. And that's actually what happened. And then the PBO estimated that a national basic income modeled after the Ontario pilot could cut poverty rates in half at a gross cost of about $90 billion a year. But we could compare the cost of poverty, which is already at least $80 billion a year. A group of BC researchers gave $7,500 to 50 homeless residents. They found no increased spending on temptation goods, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, fewer days homeless, and it actually saved society money from shelter costs. The money was pretty much spent on basic needs like rent, food, and transit. A report on the Canada Child Benefit showed that every $1 invested in the program grew the economy by $2. It was contributing hundreds of thousands of jobs a year, keeping hundreds of thousands of kids and families out of poverty, and a majority of families and kids under 18 have already benefited from this program. We know that child benefits reduced food insecurity by a third and have been called overwhelmingly responsible for reduced child poverty in Canada. Another report estimated that a national basic income could grow the economy about $80 billion a year and create hundreds of thousands of jobs. Then, during the pandemic, the CCPA reported that emergency benefits contributed to the largest one-year drop in poverty in nearly 50 years. This chart shows poverty rates plummeting in 2020. And then another report showed that those pandemic benefits kept half a million kids out of poverty. Now, after all this, what actually exists in real life? Well, there are many forms of basic income-like benefits already today. Some are guaranteed, like child and seniors benefits, or the climate rebate, which is universal. But many of them have onerous conditions to qualify and simply aren't enough to live by, like provincial disability supports. So in June, Parliament passed the Canada Disability Benefit Bill, C-22. It would create what some have called a basic income for people with disabilities. It garnered all party support, and more importantly, it would be modeled after the Guaranteed Income Supplement for seniors, which could lay out the groundwork for a broader guaranteed income scheme in the future. In late 2021, the independent senator, Kim Pate, and the MP for Winnipeg, Leah Gazan, introduced two identical bills in the Senate and in the House, which if passed would create a national framework to implement a guaranteed livable basic income. The Senate bill, S233, passed second reading in April and was sent to the National Finance Committee, where yesterday, they held the first and only hearing with an expert panel featuring Dr. Forge. Recently, we've, we've also seen a wave of city councils across Canada passing motions calling on the feds and the provinces to work towards a basic income. Why? Because cities see firsthand the real cost of poverty every single day. In Quebec, there's literally a program called basic income for people with limited capacity to work. It has the quality of a basic income without the work requirement, but some say it's a good step forward. Too many low income people are still left out because it's very, very targeted. Finally, in PEI, three party leaders, including the progressive conservative premier, Dennis King, co-signed a letter urging the feds to work with them towards a basic income. And today in the province, there's a targeted basic income for those on social assistance to lift them up to 85% of the poverty line. And there's talks about a possible province-wide program in the future. So to recap, most Canadians support some form of a basic income. There's plenty of evidence to show that it works. And we have champions in parliament who wanna see it happen. But to make it happen, we're gonna need voters, civil society, and the business community to work together and speak with one voice. Thank you.